was a 20,000 foot submersible. That, that was its rated maximum depth. And we want to go to 36,000 feet. So you've got to make the balloon bigger so you have more payload. In other words, more gas inside that thing so you can lift more. And a new cabin, because our old cabin would only take us to 20,000 feet. So we've got the Krupp Works in Essen at Germany to build a new cabin for us. And we increased the size of the balloon at the Navy shipyard in San Diego. Um, now, for me personally, I had come to this project. Uh, I've been serving in a submarine in San Diego of World War II vintage, but a very nice boat. Um, so that in mid-1958, when uh, the, the Office of Naval Research purchased the Trias from the cars, I was still serving in the submarine in San Diego. And we have something in submarines we call test depth. Test depth means that's the maximum depth you're permitted to dive. It's not where it's going to collapse. It's the max, maximum operating depth you can have. Well, the submarine I was serving in had a test depth of 300 feet. Uh, OK, yeah, you can anticipate what I'm going to say. By April of the next year, of 1959, I made a dive to 4,000 feet off San Diego. Now, that's pretty good. That's, you know, more than 10 times I'd ever gone in a military submarine. Then this was revealed to me, 36,000 feet probably just a year later. And I really got my attention because as, a, as the military commander of the Trias, I knew I'd be half of the people in it. And uh, that's it. That, you know, it's a real spin up. I moved from, say, December of uh, 58. I've been to 400 feet. By January 60, 13 months later, I've been to 36,000 feet. And I'd say that's uh, really moving right along. OK. Uh, so we did the modifications, new cabin. Uh, we extended the length of the uh, of the balloon here so that we could have more payload. And then uh, at Guam, we did a lot of test dives uh, for about six months. Each dive was a little deeper. Our first dive at Guam was 400 feet in the harbor. And these were like smoke tests. You know, what, what's going to break? What doesn't work? Test all the systems and continue fine-tuning and fixing stuff that didn't work, adding in new scientific equipment so we could make more measurements. And by um, just, uh, January of 1960, we had made a dive to 24,000 feet. And everything looked good on that. So uh, two weeks later, we made our deepest dive. And that was on 23 January, 1960. And you can see it was a little bumpy. This is, uh, that's Lieutenant Larry Shoemaker right there, who's my assistant. That's uh, Giuseppe Bruno hanging on one hand to Larry, and one hand to the bathhouse cap. Um, uh, Giuseppe helped build that and maintain the Trieste in Italy when the Picards were operating, and then shot Picard right. What they're trying to do is pick up the towing wire. The, the other end of this cable here, a one-inch wire, there's a Navy seagoing tug. Well, those of you that are boat people realize the hazard of trying to reach in there and trip a pelican hook with your bare hands when you've got a 1,200-ton seagoing tug on the other end of that wire, so we had to try and be very careful. I was warm and dry down inside the cabin doing the pre-dive check, so there's a, uh, a, a tube here, a, a, a tunnel that goes down through the middle of the float down to the cabin beneath, because the cabin's about 18 feet below the surface of the water, so you have to do it this way. At the bottom of this uh, uh, tube, there's a ladder there, is the hatch to get inside. Well, the dive began up to about uh, 9 in the morning, uh, 7.30, I mean. And uh, we uh, got down five hours and some change to the seafloor, spent about a half hour there. What happened is when we landed on the seafloor, we stirred up the bottom sediment. And that always happens every dive. You, you, the, the, the immediate layer between the bottom of the ocean and the top of the seafloor is kind of uh, soupy. It looks like it, it's like a quicksand, but very thin. Uh -oh. huh. Okay, thank you. And I kind of that. All right. Um, and, and so when we landed, we stir up that stuff every time. But what would happen, give it five minutes, 10 minutes, that little cloud would drift off. Because it's always a current, no matter where you are on the ocean, very slight current. This time it didn't happen. 
It was like being in a bowl of milk. And or somebody had painted the front of our window, our viewport white. And after 20 minutes, we couldn't remain there any longer because the day had to be timed to have plenty of sunlight before it started the dive. I showed you why. But you're doing the same maneuver in reverse. When you come back up, you gotta hook up that towing wire. And I wanna have a couple hours of sunlight at each end of the day. This is January, and even though you're in the tropics, the days are shorter. So we had a dive profile of about nine hours and something, maybe 10 hours. So after 20 minutes, we knew it wasn't, it, it just, it, it wasn't, it wasn't medicated. You, you could see any change looking out the window. It was just looking at pure white, so we came back up. We did not get a picture, that's too bad. The first picture of the bottom of the ocean, the deepest place at the bottom of the ocean, was taken 35 years later. 1995 by a Japanese unmanned vehicle. And I'll show you a picture of that one towards the end. Well, it wasn't boring. We kept busy. People said, what are you doing down there? And what, You'd be surprised with things to look at, and you're watching your instruments, you're talking to the people. Tom said, we had an underwater telephone uh, that was like a voice modulated sonar. It was wireless. You can't use radio energy, of course, underwater. And we had no wire connection. A lot of people thought we were lowered on a cable. We weren't. We were an underwater flying machine. But we could talk with very low data rate when you talk. You've probably seen the war movies where they're talking in the micro underwater and it kind of reverberates. It's very slow. But we were able to talk to the surface from all the way down. So here we are, day at the office, seven miles down. This was actually taken on the seafloor at the Challenger Deep. Life magazine had hooked up a little camera inside our cabin that we could take some pictures. So here I am, uh, you know, uh, 53 years ago, I've changed a bit since then. <laughs> uh, and I have a bunch of these American flags, which are going to be given beads and trinkets for the Indians. And we'll see that in a moment. And there is the view, uh, viewport right here. <clears throat> One eyeball, it wasn't very big. Seven inches thick, acrylic plastic. Uh, and then this is Jacques Picard, of course, and he's got this huge banner. This, that's actually a Swiss flag. It looks like a tablecloth. And I, of course, I had my supply of Hershey bars, and he had his supply of Swiss NASA bars. And you know, got to keep things sorted out. So we, after 20 minutes, we headed back up. And we're happy to be back on the surface. And it was really bumpy then. The sea state was about seven to eight, and. Uh, we got up there where we are, we couldn't see any of the ships. We, we, we had the tugboat that towed the three us down. We also had a Navy destroyer escort, which was sort of our mother ship. And so uh, I clambered up there and looked around the horizon, and there's nobody there. And 200 miles off land, you know, just, pardon? Ah, who took the picture? He's, he's ahead of me here. Very good. I'll take the rest of the day off. <laughs> take the rest of the day off. You've been very good. <laughs> no, that was taken by National Geographic. Well, the thing is, it was just that momentary thing. It's like when you wake up with a start and had a, a, a bad nightmare. You, right away, you know it's not true, but it takes you a while to unwind a bit. Because your you're, you're, uh, distance to the horizon, you're sitting on this very close in. They were there. And also, I'd gone to the Air Force Base at uh, the other end of Guam and got these little emergency radios that aviators use. Uh, if you happen to go down. And so uh, I set off the beacon. They were orbiting out in the air, and they were, they were on top of us in about two minutes. And, and, we, and then we waited for the ships to come over, put the zodiacs in the water, come pick us up. So there was a life photographer and a National Geographic photographer. And I'm not sure which one took this, but it was one of those two. And uh, we were pretty cheerful at that point, waiting. But Jacques and I were sitting on top, though, waiting for, to be picked up. We started talking about, well, when do you think somebody will come back next time to investigate this place and do some science here? And we kind of came down to about two to three years, something like that. Well, we were just a half century off. It's 53 years. We had a stowaway. That's not a very good picture, but that's a special Rolex watch, and it has this big wart on it. That's acrylic plastic. And so you could put it on your wrist, or you could wear a shirt with it. Uh, but it was it was tied off to the rungs of the ladder uh, that brought you down into the cabin. Because we didn't use that entrance to during the dive. It was, had no functional purpose during the dive, so you let it free flood. 
So anything in there is exposed to full depth pressure, which was eight tons per square inch. And Rolex built, it, it's a little folklore in all of this. I've been able to sort it out completely, but somewhere between um, three and a half dozen of these special watches. The thing is that uh, uh, they were going to test them to full depth pressure and beyond, just to make sure it would be very bad if it came up and wasn't working. So they built several. So if one crapped out in the test chamber, you could get another one because they're all handmade and uh, that would give them a spare supply. And the, the third one they tested passed successfully. And it was quite an over pressure. I think they took it, we were 36,000 feet, I think they took it to 40,000 feet equivalent in a test chamber just to make sure. And it worked. It was full depth pressure, it came up working just fine. So that was a special, um, a deep sea uh, special built by Rolex. Uh, now, this is kind of a busy slide, but um, this is basically the floor of the Challenger Deep. We're in the Marianas Trench, so it's trending in this way. The deeper the color, uh, the deeper it is. So we get in here into this lavender or purple. These are the deepest places. And what you actually have is not the Challenger Deep, which you have three deeps. You have the, uh, the Vitios Deep here. This one's not named, and then that's the Challenger Deep. And that white dot is where Jim Cameron went. And this is where I went. And then uh, Scripps sent out an unmanned lander uh, at the same time we were out there last March. And it went into this unnamed part of the Challenger Deep. So it wasn't just one place. It's three different deep places, like deep uh, uh, potholes, if you will, here. And so you can see the what the Marianas Trench looks like. This is rather shallow water, comparatively speaking. And you can see this slope, this cliff coming down deeper and deeper. And then on the other side, because remember, this trench is formed by the collision of the Pacific uh, crustal plate moving across the Pacific towards Japan, colliding with the Asian plate, which is right here, and forming this deep wrinkle, if you will, in the Earth's surface we call a trench. Well, uh, you know, some brief <coughs> fame uh, tended to our dive, but actually, <laughs> My first literary effort was writing this color story for Life magazine. And uh, that went away pretty fast. Although it's a pretty good trade in these old magazines. People keep sending them to me, and I keep sending them. So somebody's got to send a big pile. Maybe it didn't sell very well in real, real time when it first came out. That's February 1960. But you, go, you can go to these um, companies that specialize in like old National Geographic, old life, and, Tell them what you want, and they'll ship it to you. They all smell bad because they've gotten moldy, so every one of them comes in a very sort of sealed plastic pouch. And because I open it in my home, the sign it and slam it back in there and hope that you know, they get some Lysol spray and spray off my desk so I don't get that mold. It goes with the territory. Yes, sir? When you're way down there, how do you communicate with the surface? How do we communicate with the communicate with the surface when we're way down there. We have an underwater telephone. It's wireless, but it's like a sonar, you know, that they use to detect submarines. But you can modulate that sonar with a voice uh, uh, signal. And so it's, it's very slow, but it works. And it's completely wireless. It's, it's, it's just sound waves underwater. Can I want? Yeah, we speak with it, yeah. I sat on the bottom, and I was able to talk to Larry Shoemaker. I said, Trieste on the bottom, 6,000 fathoms. And he heard it, yeah. None of us thought that would happen, so we were kind of lucky. And, uh, and if you'll see here, you, you recognize the gentleman on the far left. You're all of a certain age. Uh, and there's one of the beads and trinkets right there, one of the flag, 100 flags I did. He, uh, there's Larry Shoemaker, that's our chief scientist, Dr. Andy Redmond, sir. Maybe a uh, civilian, marine biologist, myself, and Jacques Picard. And we, uh, that was a rather pleasant day, but we had to come all the way across the Pacific to meet the president in days of propeller planes. That was a drama. Okay, 1963, 10 years after Trieste was built, uh, she's retired. Pretty, you know, pretty beat up now. Remember, this is just a balloon. Oops, sorry. This is just a balloon right in here. Very thin steel sheet. 
In fact, these zebra stripes, if you're wondering what those are, those are transverse bulkheads that go from side to side inside the balloon, so that if you had to push on it with a boat or something like that, those are the strong points. Um, and then the cabin down here. But age of 10, it was a tired old girl. Had one last mission in April of uh, 63, the nuclear submarine Thresher sank off of Boston. And Trieste went back for that to do forensic dives in the wreckage. Didn't discover the wreck itself. These, this type of device is not good for doing seafloor search. But once you've located something, then you can take the train line, the train line to that work site and try and figure out what happened. Uh, it was replaced by Trieste II, Roman numeral II, you can see here. This was built by the Mare Island Naval Shipyard in San Francisco Bay. And uh, that was a design that our team at uh, the Navy Lab in San Diego had developed. It's one of those wonderful opportunities where you said, if I just had a clean sheet of paper, how would they do it? And to our our uh, experience with the Trieste for uh, three and a half, four years, we had a lot of ideas about how to do something that was a lot more efficient for doing scientific work in the ocean. Uh, but the Navy uh, now began to take notice of it. They really didn't have much to do with us, even though we were all in the Navy. And they sort of left us alone, and we served science oceanographers at the, at the uh, Navy laboratory. But uh, about this time in, in, um, uh, in the uh, um, late, uh, early 70s, mid 70s, the Navy got interested in what you could do with something like this in terms of work tasks. There were certain things on the floor of the ocean that didn't exactly belong to the United States that um, the Navy would like to have. Well, actually, the government would like to have. And uh, in one, one project, it was funded by the CIA through the Navy to pick up a uh, capsule that had been dropped from a spacecraft and gone into the ocean. And uh, there's nothing classified here because that's, uh, it's, it's just been published. The CIA has just declassified this very black operation. It was, they went to a depth of 20,000 feet down the mid-Pacific found the thing, picked it up, brought it back up. Uh, and so the, the, at this point, the, the Bathyscaphe program, the TRESH program, migrated from the research and development community, the science, scientist, oceanographic community in the Navy, to the submarine force, and it became an operational unit of the submarine force and for the rest of its life to 1984. When this Trieste number two was retired, it worked to uh, do these rather highly classified mission. And you can see that's a huge balloon. Lots of payload, three motors on the back here, lots of maneuverability. So this is a super big thing, could lift a lot up off the seafloor. But it was really never used very much at all for science. It was used for classified programs. You notice they call it Tress too, the same as the one you just saw. And the one you just saw it didn't look anything like this one. And, and uh, why was that? Well, the Navy thought that Yvonne might be watching at the Mariana Naval Shipyard because if you've been up there, you can look across the Napa River from Vallejo and you can see the shipyard, you can see all work going on. And so the original Trieste two, the slide before this one, went in one end of a big building and Trieste two came out the other end. Well, you know, a five-year-old could tell you that's not the same thing. The original Trieste was cut up in little chunks and thrown away in the middle of the night, and then this one came out there, and then, so sometimes they're not as sneaky as we ought to be. Okay, 26 years, that's not bad. I mean, you've got a quarter of a century. If you wanted to go into the deepest part of the ocean, you had to use these machines. The French Navy, by the way, in parallel with our Navy, had two Baptist caps. The first one was around 1955, uh, very contemporary with the Trieste. It was a Picard design, actually. And they used it uh, until about 1960, did I say 1955? Yeah, that was the first one. About, until about 1962, and then they built a second one called Archimedes, or Archimedes. And Archimedes had the same depth capability in ours. But that's all there was, folks. I mean, there were no other machines that could go to the deepest place in the ocean except bathyscaphe. And you can see with all that gasoline out there, it's, it was kind of throwing. I mean, more than once I got a call in the middle of the night Lieutenant Walsh is meeting again, and I go down to the Navy lab, and my, my chief uh, 
Chief John Michelle, and you just you know, put a big wad of chewing gum in your mouth, and then you get down there, and then you, you find places where you had the balloon skin, which is steel but very thin, rust had gone through, and you're weeping gasoline into the bay. And it has a pretty strong smell, so uh, we'd go in there and putty it up and hope for the best. But I don't think anybody really understood that we had 34,000 gallons of highly explosive aviation gasoline sitting between these piers at the Navy Lab near Point Loma, uh, Battles Point. Uh, and if it went off, it would have taken out the whole waterfront of the lab. I mean, it was, I was aware of it, but uh, I didn't say a lot because I'm going to lose my job. Yes. What was the reason to use gasoline rather than oil? Why do we use gasoline instead of oil? Because the lighter the fraction you can get of petroleum, the more buoyancy you can get per volume, per say, cubic foot. If the oil, we would, uh, we'd have to have the balloon much bigger to get the same amount of lift. Uh, it's a good question. I mean, oil would have been safer, yeah. But um, we'd have to have a, a completely <coughs> different balloon, huge. So aviation gasoline was commonly available. There are other petroleum fractions that even give you more lift, but if they're exotic, like benzene, you can't, you know, it's not in every corner. We just go across the harbor to the Naval Air Station in San Diego, where the carriers come, and we pump a bunch of gas in our thing and go back to the lab. And then when we're ready to take it out of the water, we could lift it out, it could be lifted with that in it, just fall apart. We'd have to pump it out, so we'd give it back to the Navy. The aviators never liked that. You know, we thought it was a one-way trip. I'd sign a ship for 34,000 gallons and give it to them, and go back and I wanted credit for it. And they, they felt that this was not very sporting. I mean, no one gives back fuel to the naval aviation people and probably make our airplanes not work so well. But they had to take it, so. So it was commonly available wherever we went. Um, did I address this last one? Oh yeah, okay. Uh, after the last bat scout was retired in 84, we came to a new family, the 20,000 foot man submersible. That's, uh, uh, operating depth. Um, the, uh, actually, in 1983, the Trias was replaced with a thing called the sequin, which is this thing. You see this kind of dowager's hump all over that thing? We didn't even use gasoline anymore. We, we discovered a material called syntactic foam, and it was um, microscopic glass spheres. If you put them in your hand, it looks like dust. But if you put them under a microscope, you see each one of those spheres traps a little bubble air. Now you get a whole bunch of plastic epoxy, and you make a matrix of this stuff, and it's lighter than water. And so you could saw it, you could cast it, you could do anything, and it doesn't and won't blow up on you, but it's pretty neat stuff. So material science over these years had advanced. We had this new material for buoyancy and titanium for cabins, so you could get the same depth capability with a much lighter cabin, stronger material. So that's uh, the first one of these was the Navy, U.S. Navy replaced the Trieste with a sea cliff, a 20,000 foot submersible. Next came the French with a built from the keel up submersible called Nautil or Nautilus. And then uh, the Russians came in with their Mir 1 and Mir 2 submersible, Mir being the Russian word for peace. And these were actually built in Finland at the very end of the Cold War. And then more recently, uh, I've indicated here, they now have, the Russian Navy's got two of the same capability called Rus and Russia and Consul, like Consul subs. So the, Russia today has four of these things that can go to 20,000 feet. And uh, one of the last countries to join the depth parade was Japan, Shinkai 6,500. Well, that's meters, 6,500 meters, which means it can go to 21,325 feet. So for the longest time, Japan had the deepest diving man submersible of the world, Japan. But this year, uh, last June, the, uh, China has now a 23,500-foot 23, uh, 23, depth capable Jiaolong or Sea Dragon. And it's a very nice submersible. It's uh, well made and they've got a good program. Form follows function, doesn't it? As Lecopius I said that uh, you have a function and the form is almost dictated by the mission. And so that's what you, it looks, it's not a copycat. It's wholly designed and developed in China. It was a, 
a couple of five-year plans. They're very, uh, been very prudent about the development, very conservative developing this thing. They bought a lot of Western equipment to put on it, just like you and I would. Uh, you know, we've been out to Sears catalog. We're not going to build a refrigerator but buy one off out of the catalog. So people say, oh, yeah, you know, the Chinese are copying everything. No, they're not. They copy. It's just like you look catalog, you see a good camera or some lights, batteries, and you do it yourself. That is, you buy it and do it yourself. Okay, and of course, the traditional picture of planting the national flag. This is a manipulator on the front, a uh, mechanical arm on the front of the sub with the Chinese flag in the bottom of the ocean at a depth of uh, 7,000 meters, 23,500 feet. Uh, now there are three programs that are working on full depth manned vehicles. The first one I've alluded to, and that's Jim Cameron. He re returned to the Challenger Deep on 26 March 2012, and I was fortunate enough to be uh, involved with Jim <coughs> doing some uh, consulting with him. This is sub, when it's on deck, it's sub, so it's uh, lengthwise, uh, you'll see in a moment. And so it's lying down, that's Jim himself. Um, and this is how it works, it's like a sparkle. You Those you of boat people, you know what a sparkle looks like. And, and it's kind of clever because your direction of travel is vertical. Like you're, you want to be streamlined in this direction, not, this, not like a, a boat because you're going vertically. So he set up the whole thing so that it's uh, it's like a big. This is in its operating position, vertical like this. You got a whole bunch of batteries and lights here. Uh, this is the top. It's on the surface. You got pingers here and a radio beacon, and then the cabin, spherical cabin, ball, 48 inches in diameter. And Jim's about six two, but he you know he started taking up yoga so he could <laughs> fold up in small places and meditate. And so the captain's right down here, and then he's got uh, lights and cameras in a manipulator, uh, an artificial arm that allows him to do work it's the, on the sea floor. And here he is rigged out. So we're looking, uh, divers, uh, this is the surface, we have some of the divers that are rigging it, and here's the vehicle in its operating position. That's the wind, big viewport, and he's inside there. And these arms are for lights, because if you put these lights out a ways, then you get less backscatter when you're trying to take pictures. Because the lights were right here, you get a lot of reflection back from particulates in the water. But if you can put them out on these arms, you get a lot more depth of field, if you will. And uh, down here he is, a happy explorer, uh, re returning on deck uh, after actually doing it. I think the dive was around six hours and something. Because it was streamlined the way I showed you, he got to the seafloor in about um, 60 minutes. 70 minutes, something like that. It took me five and a half hours. <laughs> so he was really rocketing along down there. And I had this picture initially of him spearing into the bottom, you know, like an arrow. <laughs> and he can't get himself out, but I guess he uh, thought of that too. And uh, before the dive, I, I wished him uh, good luck. I said, you know, good luck, have fun. He slammed the lid shut, and then after he came back up, I was the first one to, uh, to greet him. And uh, it was quite a day. Uh, so honored to be included with us. That's his wife, Susie Amos. Uh, you may have seen her in the movie Titanic. She was the young girl that was the, I think, the granddaughter of, the, of Rose who had the pendant and all of that. If you don't remember the story, then this is all going over your head. But so they've been married 11 years, got a couple of kids. She's a very nice lady and glad she could be out. I'll tell you, the, I'll tell you a little story about that in the control center on the mothership. It was all set up that we had a printout coming out on a regular basis, the acoustic telemetry, like our acoustic telephone, except it was sending data up to us as printing out on a chart. We gave the time, the depth, the time, and we knew exactly where it was. And Susie's over there in the corner there, twittering uh, through this underwater acoustic telephone. And um, now he gets on the bottom. He, uh, he reports that he's there, and she says, well done, you know, wifely kinds of things. But later he quipped you and said, Jim goes to show you, no matter where a man goes, the <laughs> wife can still find him. <laughs> still get him on the phone. Uh, yeah, the, the hard hat out on the deck was just that there was a lot of overheads to cranes and things. And, that was a regulation of the company that owned the mothership. We were renting the ship from them. 
and they required when I were out on deck aft where the sub was, you had to wear the hard hat. It all looked a little goofy, but um, that, that was the rules. Okay, this, this is exactly the same scale. That's, uh, this is his sub, and this is my 12 tons, 150 tons. So uh, that's what 52 years will do for you. A lot of people ask me um, uh, interviews after the, his dive. I was plan B because when they couldn't get Jim for interviews and things like that, they'd get me. And um, I did, I think, 75 interviews in about a month and a half. Everything from a journalist, a uh, lady journalist in Greece and Athens on the phone to standing in front of a camera of BBC. So it, it was never boring, but it, uh, it, it was time consuming. And um, a lot of people would ask me, what's different? What was different between your time and my time? And I think it's kind of apparent here, but of course I couldn't show them the picture. I would say, well, if you had Orville Wright and you rolled out his little airplane, the first airplane ever flew, and you had a 747 standing right next to it, what's the difference? Because it's the same number of years between when Orville Wright flew and the first 747 flew that when I made my dive and Jim made his dive. And usually that stopped off those questions. Yes, sir. <laughs> Very good. Thank you for asking. Uh, right here, this looks like teats on a cow, but actually, yeah. those uh, to to get it to go down, you have to make heavier water. But it's also a good deal to uh, at, at some point when you want to come back up, get rid of it. Well, you can't use compressed air. Remember, we're talking about sixteen thousand pounds per square inch. You're not going to use like an air bottles for scuba, which three thousand maximum, maybe a little more. So uh, we had to use solid waste. So here and here beneath the balloon were two large tubs or hoppers, and each was filled with eight tons of steel ballast, like BBs, except these were steel. BBs, I think, what left in their copper coated, something like that. But we, uh, at the very bottom of these hoppers, here and here, this an opening. It's surrounded by electromagnet. When you activate the electromagnet, this little steel pellets are magnetized and they won't go through the hole. You turn off the power, they're no longer magnetized and they flow. So it's sort of like a magnetic valve right here, there. And also, these two tubs could be dropped in an emergency. They're held to the bottom of the balloon with large magnets, which are wired into the main electrical system so that even if uh, we're inside here, we're incapacitated, as soon as the battery power went below a certain level, those magnets would release and you'd you would lose both these tubs. Each tub, when full, held eight tons of steel pellets. Mm -hmm. And then the empty tubs themselves uh, weighed about um, a thousand pounds each. So you get rid of a lot of weight real fast. What about the deep sea challenger? Oh, oh, okay. He's, what he's got is, uh, let me back up just a little bit on the deep sea challenger. The question was, how does he do it? just want to show you an underwater shot, it's easier. <clears throat> right here at the top, where the, and that's what the divers are doing now, he had large balloons or bags that were tied off to the thing. So when it was put into the water, it would be floating vertically, but it was held to the surface by these buoyancy bags. And these divers would remove these bags and then toggle the last one, and down he'd go. Because down here, he's got large steel plates, chunks of uh, flat steel that are held in place by uh, magnets on each side down here. So he could release, uh, he, he wanted to get down fast, so he wasn't too hurt, uh, uh, concerned about getting started going pretty fast, but once he detected the seafloor beneath him, then he started to slow down by selectively dropping these steel plates. And do it very carefully, because if you drop one too many, you know, you're gonna stop, come right back up, you can't stop yourself. Yeah. I mean, a positive point, so that's how he did it. It took uh, some piloting skill, for sure. Okay, uh, and uh, he had a watch, and Rolex did it again. I suggested when, we're out in, uh, uh, when I was out in Sydney, Australia, last January, uh, their senior marketing guy came over from Geneva, and I said, well, you know, it's really too bad. Uh, you guys should have thought about developing a 50-year-later special Rolex to put on Jim's son, and we have this history, half-century of Rolex engineering excellence and all of that. 
but knowing how you know conservative Swiss company, he being in a Brussels attack because he was a conservative Swiss, um, you can't do it that fast. You know, I've been associated with the company a long time, and I know you don't move that fast. And by golly, he went home, went home and started yelling at people, and one thing or another, in five weeks, a team of engineers working 24-7, males coming into the workbench, were, um, built uh, uh, five of these watches. And they were uh, a, a special Rolex. Now they didn't have the big wart on the, for the crystal. They had a new material, a kind of sapphire, that was a flat disc that could handle eight tons per square inch. It's amazing, amazing engineering feat. The case is a little, you'll see at the moment, the case is a little thicker for that depth, but it was an amazing thing. So here we are, Jim and I, with our watches. I have a replica, not the original, of the one I had with me, the model of Trieste. Jim's showing his, and there's the his sub lying down on its side on the deck of the mothership. And there, look at that. And if you didn't know, you'd say it's a regular Rolex, you see this store. And it's just a little bit bigger. It's not um, obscenely bigger. It's, it's a meaty looking watch. But it, you could wear that with a shirt and a, a rather liberal button cuff. And uh, it's an amazing piece of engineering. So that's what it looks like right there. And there it is on the arm. See the wrist manipulated? So I didn't have a manipulator. We had, I can't remember, it was on the rungs of the ladder to get out of the cabin. But this is his mechanical arm right here, and there's the watch. So he's able, from his cabin inside, take a picture of this thing. And the big thing we worried about was to make sure it kept running. Because you know how Rolex works. I mean, it's, you've got to move. My wife claims I'm so lazy and my Rolex runs down. Because you get, you know, it's got a little weight in there that keeps it wound. Well, we had it out at sea, and we're definitely afraid that if you just put it somewhere for a couple of days, it's the, it starts going off on time accuracy. And, and all our data, electronic data, that's being photographed and telemetered has exact time. And if the watch doesn't agree with that, it's kind of a no-no. By the way, uh, Rolex tested these watches to 50,000 feet, just to make sure. And the first one they tested passed uh, you know, very well. And so we had a special guy on board. One of our technicians was trained by a Rolex watchmaker at Guam about how to keep that watch alive. So every day when we were having our meals in the cruise mess, we'd be over in the corner of these two watches. We had spares with us just in case something happened, and polishing it up and making sure it was set, and then just kind of giving it this to wind it up for the day. Well, again, I have already done this, so I won't dwell on it. That's where he went, this is where I went, and that's where the other man, Lander, Scripps Lander went. And of course, your, your own local hero here, Chris Branson. Uh, is he still here? He left? No, no, we're here. Where are you? Bright lights. Oh, I see, yeah, okay. Yeah. Bright lights, please. Applause. But anyway, so Chris, uh, you know, this is his sub uh, around here. He, he, he decided that he needed a deeper pocket, so he went after Richard Branson, but it's really Chris that's doing all of this. And uh, you know all about it, because you folks live here. Um, God willing, it'll ever look that good. Uh, isn't that nice? Nice artwork, flying underwater. Uh, and that concept goes back to a fellow named Graham Hawks, a, uh, a Brit who uh, emigrated to the United States in the early 90s. And he had this concept of a flying submersible. And you can see it very much like an airplane. Um, it has wings and, and motors, propellers back here. And the idea is you can do hydrobotics and you can move very swiftly underwater. Um, it's, it's a work in progress. And, and then he built this one called Deep Flight Aviator, and where people could actually ride with Graham. I've made dives in this, so is Chris. And uh, it's kind of fun. It's like flying a little airplane underwater, a little heavy on the controls, but uh, a lot of fun. So that was kind of the uh, uh, enabling technology. This is the kind of things they want to do. You know, the name of their program is the Five Dives five trenches, something like that. Anyway, here we are. We've got the, the deepest places in each of the oceans. In the bottom, we, we have here the um, Puerto Rico Trench. We've got South Sandwich Trench down the Antarctic, Southern Ocean. Puerto Rico Trench, of course, in the Atlantic. Deepest place in the Atlantic. Deepest place in the Southern Ocean that goes around the Antarctic would be South Sandwich Trench. Molloy Deep, which is the uh, deepest place in the Arctic up here, Arctic Ocean. Uh, the uh, Diamantina. 
deep here in the Indian Ocean off the west coast of Australia, and of course the Marianas Trench, which you already met. So that's their campaign once the submarine becomes fully operational as a deep diving sub. If you want to know more about it, then I would defer to uh, my friend in the back. And if we took the outside covering off, this is what you'd see. And here's our friend. That's your syntactic phone I introduced you to earlier. The battery packs back in here. The cabin is kind of interesting. It actually is at an angle. And uh, see if I hang on back up. I can't really see it. No. It, it, well, the cabin, it, um, Chris has to kind of lie down. It, it's uh, angled off like this, so it's a little hard for me to do it here. But it's not parallel with the axis of the structure, but rather pitches downward, so he's in a, it's kind of in a recumbent position. And just in third place is a company, a Trident Submarine Company in Barrow Beach, Florida. And they've got, uh, that's not a great picture. I, I'm, I've uh, been scolding them because they don't really have good images out there for people to use. I'll have to fix this later. Anyway, Triton 36K, 36,000 feet. Uh, have an all glass pressure hole. Can you imagine that? Glass is very, very strong, really strong. But it also is tricky. How do you? make a new piece of glass for a picture frame. You take a piece of glass and you score it. You have a glass cutter. It doesn't really cut the glass, does it? You just make a scratch in it. And then you tap it and it breaks along. That's a stress concentrator, that line. So that it becomes very brittle and will break along that line. Great for making picture frames. Not so good for people frames. People bowl, I like to call them, because you're inside and the fish are looking at you. So uh, this is some special technology to, to feel comfortable with and to build a uh, spherical pressure hole, but it's one large window. I have made dives in uh, submersibles similar to this uh, down a few hundred feet where the, the hull is made out of acrylic plastic. Acrylic plastic is absolutely marvelous. Uh, because you can sandpaper it, you can take out your Swiss Army knife and gouge it, and it's not going to hurt it. You may not be able to see so good. But it's, uh, it's being plastic. It always adjusts to um, um, pressures on it. And it, it, it doesn't have stress risers or concentrators, like I said, with glass. So this is magic stuff. I'd say they're a few years away. Uh, but some of the fundamental technologies now has been developed and, and being tested. And I think it's magic. Maybe Chris could tell us more about it. But, uh, <coughs> excuse me. He's, uh, he's made a dive in their 1,000 foot sub, which looks a lot like this. Okay, so from B.B. and Barton, 1930, 1934, scientists of today in Woods Hole's Alvin Submersible. What we're doing is taking the train line and the train dive to the work site. That's the whole idea. Put people inside the ocean to make direct observations. And we call this in situ, it's the Latin word for being there. And uh, this is our good friend, uh, Tolia Sakalevich, inside the Mir, the Russian Mir Submersible. Uh, he's directing that program. Uh, Chris and I were just with him last week in uh, Monterey, the big underwater film festival. This guy here was also there. It looks like Rasputin Monk, doesn't he? That's, that's American. Henry Kristoff, who uh, yeah, was with National Geographic for 40 years. Emery was also with us last week. So. Uh, Without leaving the scene, we should talk about the unmanned submersion. There's two of them that have gone to the Challenger Deep. The first one was Kaiko, which is the Japanese word for trench. It went to the uh, Challenger Deep twice, the first time in 1995. Remember, I said that was the first picture ever made on the seafloor. Because they can put it down there and park it. You don't have people in it. So you just leave there a couple days, and the cloud dissipated and made the pictures. The second one, as a, as a unmanned submersible made by Woods Hole, a uh, oceanographic institution back in Massachusetts, uh, and it's called Nereus. And it got to the Challenger Deep in um, uh, May of 2009. So we got uh, Kaiko twice and Nereus once. And, uh, and then Richard Branson, uh, not Branson, uh, myself, and, uh, and 
and Jim Cameron uh, are the two mad ones. And folks, that's that's it. Uh, stay tuned. We're going to keep going down there. And by the way, the um, I know some of you thought, well, what's so magic about 20,000 feet? Why don't you stop there? The deepest place is 36,000 feet. It's because if you can dive to 20,000 feet in the ocean, you can actually look at 98% of the seafloor. So that's what engineers and bean counters would call cost-benefit ratio. We pay to develop a submersible that goes a little more than half the maximum depth of the ocean, 20,000 versus 36,000, and but we can get 98% of the seafloor. That's pretty damn good. That's why you've got seven of these vehicle manned submersibles clustered around a uh, water depth of 20,000 feet. Uh, that's not an excuse not to go that last 2% because that last 2% is equivalent to the area of the continental United States, Alaska, and about half of Mexico, and tossing Hawaii. Yeah. So that's a lot of that's a lot of area we looked at. And so we, we're going to have to have the maximum depth submersibles so that we can uh, investigate the deep ocean trenches. Um, why are they important? Because they're part of the whole process. I'm sure many of you have um, seen lectures and talks and things about plate tectonics and how the surface of our planet is made up of 19 uh, or 20, depending on the count, of these crustal plates. And they're all moving around. Because of the ocean ridges, like the mid-ocean ridge and the Atlantic Ocean, uh, you have seafloor being created. The materials coming up from inside the earth, you've probably all seen these pictures of uh, uh, black smokers, you know, little volcanoes on the seafloor and the black stuff coming out and all that light that lives down there. Lots of places where seafloor is being created. Well, our planet's not swelling up, is it? It's the same shape. So somewhere, you have to get rid of that seafloor that's being created. And on about a 200 million year cycle, these plates are moving to a place where they are subducted, that is returned to the interior of the earth and recycled. That's why one of the great dilemmas in the early days of marine geology was you could never find a rock on the floor of the ocean that was over 200 million years old. And yet you go to Iceland, you can get 4.7 billion, just about the age of our planet, ancient rock. Well, what's, what's what happened? Well, now we know. The life of a crustal plate of the ocean is about 200 million years. So we've done a lot of work on the uh, spreading zones where seafloor is being created, because that's a depth of about 9,000 feet. I've made dives on a, a mid-Atlantic ridge uh, near the Azores a few years ago. And it's fascinating to see. But you've got to look at the whole system. And the trenches have never really been studied. So that's why this kind of technique, this, this kind of equipment is so important. We've got to do the whole thing. We have to understand the fundamental um, uh, operation of our planet, if you will. And uh, that, ladies and gentlemen, I have a final slide, and I'm going to get a glass of wine here in a minute. I don't know about you, but this is not a red necktie I'm wearing, it's my tongue. Okay, actually, I'm going to take questions. I say that out loud, folks, because then uh, somebody will shag back there and get me a glass of wine, and I'll stay here and answer your question. You've already asked one, so I'm going to ask him. Animal life, very good question. Just before we landed, uh, and we're blinded, if you will, we saw a flatfish about a foot long, like a small sole, or halibut. And then, and no one's ever seen that again. I tell Jim, next time, please find that, because the theologists say, no, they're not fish down there. Well, I didn't see you standing next to me, so <laughs> that's, folks are still open. Uh, so at, on the dive, in the water column, we saw the usual invertebrates. See, a, a sole or a flatfish is, tells you several things. It's a high order marine vertebrate. It's got a spine like we do. It lives there because they're bottom dwelling fish. If there's one there, there's more. And that means that there is uh, oxygen to support them and food. So that one glimpse told us a lot. Uh, otherwise, we saw a lot of the invertebrates like the jellies and the uh, shrimps, things like that. Yes, sir, no. Question. One question. Does buoyancy change with depth? And two, have you had any harrowing experiences? Hmm. Do you want to take the rest of the day off? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I did, but I, I'm okay. Uh, the question was, uh, do we lose buoyancy with depth? Uh, Does it change? Does it change? That's better. And um, any harrowing? Any harrowing experiences? Yes, on both. 
Okay, how do we lose buoyancy? Because uh, AH gasoline is more compressible than seawater. So as you go down and see what are squeezing, it's not an even contest. We lost about 13% of the volume of the aviation gasoline during the dive. Of course, we cut back, it's not lost, it doesn't go anywhere. It's just being squeezed into a smaller space. So that our balloon has to have uh, compensating pipes so seawater can come inside. If it didn't, it would crush the balloon. So you, you let, you let seawater come into the balloon because the gas is gonna float on top while it floats on water, so that's not a problem. And during the dive, 13%. Uh, do we have any harrowing experiences? Well, we did. We, we had a window break, um, which was uh, disconcerting. It, I told you about the entrance tube. We come down to the bottom of the float. There's a 90 degree elbow, if you will, there. And then there's the hatch in the, inside. Once you're inside, you close that hatch. Then you don't use that tube anymore during the dive. On the tree axle. In the back of the tube, just below the balloon, there was a, a, a cylindrical section, a curlic window. And that was nothing more than to let you look through the small viewport in the hatch, through the water fill tube, and out to the back end of the bathhouse cap. Because you have a shot tub back there, um, a hopper, and you had lights back there and that kind of thing. And it's just sort of the, for the pilot to be able to check that everything was working back there, <coughs> not to make observations of the seafloor. Um, that large, it was about this size, this high and about that wide and about that thick. It didn't have to be really pressure resistant, except on the surface when the tube was uh, empty of water, then you're about 18 feet down. So a certain amount of pressure on it, but not much. Okay, but remember I said this is a quick plastic. If you take child's modeling clay and you make a rectangle like this, then put it between your two palms. Yeah, and you push like that, it moves in the unconstrained direction, but it squirt, squeezes out, or like jelly on bread, you know, like that. Uh, well, when they each install that window in the steel frame, they should have elongated the bolt, uh, the, uh, bolt holes. So as that thing moved back and forth, it could, and the bolt could still be there, but the window could move fairly freely. Well, they didn't do that. So it stored up a lot of energy, because it's going like that, and it's trying to, you know, uh, move. And so all of that stored energy was liberated at about 31,000 feet. Great bang. But 31,000 feet is 5,000 pounds per square inch pressure down there. So if in fact we had reached a pressure, pressure boundary, we would, would have been dead before we knew we were dead instantaneously. Uh, and, and so we looked around, what is that? We don't know. Uh, we looked at all our instruments, everything was working good, so we just continued the dive. Oh, yeah, maybe it was, it was not good. See, it was, everything's good, so let's do it. Yes, sir. Uh, I didn't see any cables anywhere. Were there cables on all these, or? Well, yeah, all our wiring is, uh, you know, we have various devices topside that uh, we have to bring uh, uh, to, to, well, for lights, uh, for the uh, magnetic uh, arms that hold hopper in place, all of that, and, and so, and also a, a piping for our pressure gauge. We, uh, and that runs, remember I showed you a picture of my office and arranged around the viewport in front are openings called penetrators and the cables and wires go through there. That took a long cable to take that. No, 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 we weren't lowered on a cable. Yeah. The bathhouse gap was free flying. I mean, once we left the surface, we weren't hanging on to anything. Not like with, you know, uh, the bathysphere that BB had. Yes, that was lowered on a cable. Uh, but the, the bathyscap is a uh, underwater free balloon. Okay. Okay. Uh, in the back. You ever have any need for zinc plates? Do we have any need for zinc plates? So you're talking about uh, uh, the, the cathodic protection, yeah. yeah. Yes, we did. We had them. Uh, get my pointer here. We carried a set of zincs. Uh, back here, there's a, there's a small stabilizing fin. I think you can probably see it. I can't quite remember this. There's some bars like that. And that's the only place we carried them. Uh, and then we, uh, when we rebuilt the thing, the Trieste II, we used an active cathodic protection system because as you put stuff under your payload, because you know, one dive will be working with a geologist and he's got certain tools he wants to carry. 
next time it might be a biologist, he's got other tools. So you're always changing that kind of electrical signal. So we put an active system so we could read uh, what the voltages were and adjust it so that it was always neutral. Yeah, we, we did have that. Any other? Well. One more back here. Ah, I, didn't, I can't see that. Who is it? Okay. Any uh, uh, practical use for using the depth and pressure to manufacture or do other things down that deep? I think you all heard that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, not really because, uh, I mean, a pressure, uh, what you're describing is, is, is one manufacturing technique but not to use a big device like this. You just get a, 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 a commercial pressure pot. Uh, in fact, what we used in the early days, in our project at, at the Navy lab in San Diego, we got, uh, we found an old battleship gun up at <coughs> Navy Ammunition Depot up in Idaho, 12 inch gun. And uh, we cut the, most of the barrel off of it. We kept the breech maybe 10 or 15 feet of it. And because there's tremendous pressure in one of those big battleship guns when they fire off the bullet. And so we made that into a pressure uh, chamber, test chamber. And uh, a lot of people were using naval shells, five inch shells and such, and tip them up on end. And you'd, you'd, you'd build a fitting on the end where you could put your penetrators through for testing things, running motors and so on. And, and so that, that's really the way it, it, it started out. And then today you can buy commercial ones that will take you down quite deep, equivalent in the ocean. But that's the way you would use pressure for manufacturing processes, not something like this. Any more? A little more, not. Hi. Uh, you said that it took you five hours to get down, mm -hmm. and the um, uh, one man took him one hour. How long did it take Chris to get down? And come back, or just to go down? <laughs> <laughs> See. The secret of all of this is uh, uh, lots of people have gone to the bottom of the ocean. It's coming back <laughs> that uh, is really important, and that's how we define um, ocean engineering. Chris? Uh, two hours and 20 minutes. Look at that. And you'll stay down 24 hours. Uh, stay down, two hours and 20 minutes down, uh, probably be on the bottom on the order of eight hours, and then the, another two hours to come back. They tell me this is uh, Vintage's next Tuesday, so uh, <laughs> enjoy. Do you have atmospheric pressure inside the uh, Yeah. The, old the, the pressure inside the cabin is one atmosphere, just like here, because of the thick hull. Yes, ma'am? Um, that's absolutely wonderful to call this. And may I refer to Chris and ask, where's the sub right now? Because <laughs> it's not on the... Yeah, the, the, my sub is in, the, in Monterey. It was at the Blue Film Festival the last two weeks. Coming home tomorrow. Uh, I don't know that we're going to put it back on the on the cap tomorrow. That we may uh, keep it in the in the workshed for a week or two. And we've got some work to do. And what's your update? When's your predicted? Um, well, we have um, our new dome, which is what we've been waiting for. Uh, we should get our hands on that somewhere around December first, plus or minus. It's getting very tangible now. And then we have to fit it and do pressure testing. Um, which will be several months to do. Then go back to test study. Yes. I have a I have a question. If if James Cameron's wife was able to use a telephone to get in touch with him, why can't Chris Welsh have something to do? <laughs> That's his mother asking <laughs> I don't have a dog. I don't have a dog in this fight, so you two are <laughs> system was calm and navigation, communication and navigation all blended together and it had an excess of a million dollars invested in, uh, in getting that to go and got the calm part worked as, as promised and the nav part, I think basically you could say half worked as promised. The, the service knew where he was but he was planning to use it to navigate to other things as well and that part of it uh, signaling back and forth never really developed correctly. Anymore. I can't quite see these lights, that's why. 
Um, there's one. Yes, sir. What's the primary mission that you're going to take the sub down? I mean, what's the real, what are they looking for? Well, it depends on uh, on the uh, what the scientists want to do. I, I mean, I'm, it's not a good answer, but these are platforms. Just like an oceanographic ship is a platform or a pickup truck. It depends on your payload. Depends on how you want to use the truck for any particular activity. These dives that we made on Guam were to were to prove out the platform. We were not really doing oceanographic research, although we did take some data. But basically, the Navy purchased the Trieste as a scientific platform to be used by oceanographers. So we wanted to prove it out that it was reliable, effective, uh, and uh, and safe. And that was our, our diving, take it to the ultimate death and uh, re ring it out, make sure that it was ready for anybody in this room to safely make a dive and not have to worry about the technique or safety or anything else, but what they saw out of the window and what their instrumentation was telling them. Now, it's the strongest, uh, for a trained mind and trained eye in the environment, the strongest areas of science are the observational sciences like biology and geology. I mean, if you're an acoustics guy, look out the window, you're not seeing a sound pattern or anything, or even light in the sea. Um, you've got better instruments to do that. But um, for, for, you know, just to back up a bit, we've done oceanography, you know, as the science goes back to about 1870, the Challenger Expedition Royal Society in England, to your round the world trip. And what they do is they, they, you know, they lower things in the water, artificial hands by samplers and grab stuff and bring it up. Uh, artificial eyes in later years in the form of cameras, you get images. But it's kind of like floating over New Mexico on a dark night in a balloon and lowering a grapple down and, and you pull up a couple of Gila monsters and maybe a policeman. And then you go to uh, a learned, uh, in Monaco, a learned, learned uh, a science meeting and you, um, you say, well, this place, New Mexico, is full of policemen and human monsters. And, uh, and, and so what we're doing is putting those eyes inside the sea at the work site to make direct observations. I mean, on land, would a biologist, uh, was it say a botanist, go through the jungle on a motorcycle? No, he's on all fours and he's lifting things up and looking at And he's also seeing the context of the living system. You know, how does this plant uh, interact with other plants? Uh, what's, what's the relationship? Or our animals? How is that uh, biome working? Then you can take your samples out. But the ways we've done in research ship, you're on the surface and you're going down there and pulling up something and you're wondering, well, how does this fit into the overall thing, uh, the, you know, the system? With, with uh, vehicles like this, you can do it. Now the heavy lifting in doing uh, deep ocean research will be unmanned vehicles. But we still need uh, a, a certain number of manned vehicles because it's very hard to beat the, this great computer we have on top of our necks and uh, the sense of awe and wonder and, and also the sense of surprise. You can't surprise an instrument. That's what Roger Abel told me once, he the great high priest of American oceanography. I said, Roger, why man? He says, because you can't surprise an instrument. It only knows what you told it to. Um, and I think Jim nailed it even better in, in March. We had a meeting up in Santa Ana, Santa Ana, right after his dive. You know, the paint wasn't even dry, and he said, well, what kid wants to grow up to be a robot? <laughs> there you are. But anyway, uh, it, it's mission sensitive, but basically the observational science is the other. Uh, my field is physical oceanography, which are the motions of the oceans, the interaction of the atmosphere and the oceans and tides and waves. I wouldn't get much out of this kind of thing. So. I mean, your question's got a, 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 a good point to it. What kinds of things, but specific things, I can't tell you. That's what the science would tell me. He says, I, we'd sit down with them and he'd say, I, can I measure this? And I got this kind of equipment. And we try and help them out and configure uh, the, the vehicle for that dive. Now, Chris, you might have a different take on that. Well, I just think there's more I can add to it. Um, good. The, the things that we're being asked to do. Um, first of all, we've got hopefully a lot of, lot of uh, range, you know, 12 to 15 miles on the floor. So that's a, a chance to go explore. Um, we actually brought together conferences of scientists and said, look, here's our capabilities, here's what we can't do, what do you want us to bring back? And I was expecting sample grabbing and things like this. And what I got back was actually they really wanted video. 
HD video because uh, the NSF will fund them. If you can show that this lump is a, a, a deep sea mud volcano or mud you know, uprising, uh, then they can go back and get money to sample that. And that's a, that's a very interesting place because you're getting uh, mud that come up to potentially hundreds of miles below the surface. And you're getting sampling below the surface of the Earth's crust that way. But if it's just a lump, the NSF, it's just a lump. It's not worth spending money on, on hypotheses of what's there. So if we bring back a, a, a video of that, that's the deliverable. Um, what we're planning to do is to, to put that video out there. We have what I call HD sonar. We have a very uh, uh, high definition sonar. It's 90 degrees wide, 30 degrees tall. Co-locate those in the nose of the sub. And they're time stamped together. So you can fly along, you see the bump visually. The sonar confirms the bump. There's other uh, instrumentation we're going to take that can sense sulfur dioxide, CO2, chemicals like that in the water. So you fly over it, they sense the, the sulfur dioxide or whatever was coming out with that mud. And that's a whole picture to get a scientist to evaluate that little part of that dot. And um, we have specific geographical things that they've asked us to go after and look at like that. Well, one of the big goals is to fly one of the walls. The walls are not like um, the Grand Canyon. They're much, much flatter. Um, but you know, one of our goals is we try and, and observe all that and bring back all these observations, which then you can then build upon and take places. Our goal is 36,000. That's the design that. So we'll be here on it. Okay, well, I, in, in uh, TV, we call this a message from the sponsor. Thank you, Chris. Back to our regular program. This will be the last question, please. I think I'm holding a lot of you hostage, so yes, sir. Uh, wasn't there a uh, application to have uh, an arm nuclear warhead? Uh, I can't say. Yeah. There was. I think I know what you're talking about. Talking about the project of Zorian which was uh, uh, CIA-sponsored, where they used that uh, ship, which is supposed to be a Howard Hughes drill ship, but in fact it was a CIA asset, to try and pick up a, a Russian, a Soviet uh, diesel sub that sank north of Hawaii in 16,000 feet of water. And they did actually pick it up, but as they were picking it up, it broke. The big feet broke off, they just got part of it. So that was not a Navy project, it was a CIA project, although it was a seagoing operation. And that sub had, uh, it was an early missile sub, and it had three uh, medium range missiles uh, with nuclear warheads. And I understand it may have had a nuclear warhead torpedo, I'm not sure about that. But they wanted to get that section that had the warheads. Were they successful or not? They don't say. They got some of it up. Okay.